Well, welcome all of you to this forum tonight. And wow, um, the turnout is really exciting. So um, I want to thank the Musicians Union for letting us be here. They're letting us use their hall for free. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Fife, clapped for him. Um, this forum is sponsored by the Economic Crisis Committee of Jobs with Justice. Um, and it was put together by a very hardworking planning committee. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would like the members of the planning committee to please stand for a minute and, and get clapped. Dave King, Lori King, Ted Gleitman, where's Ted? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Bar, and Ben And we will be um, passing the hat later to help with the food, so don't leave early. <laughs> um, so the, the purpose of this forum is to talk about how we can bring together the issues of climate policy and jobs. Um, there, I just was reading a report today that the International Labor Organization put out that talks about the, our ability to create between 15 and 60 million new jobs globally over the next 20 years. But it isn't going to happen automatically. We all have to work together to make sure the right policies are enacted for it to happen. Um, and in Oregon, that means labor and enviros have to figure out ways to work together. Unfortunately, as many of you know, that's not been an easy task. And especially lately, um, a lot of us are pretty painfully aware about the issues that divide us. Um, labor arguing on the one hand that environmentalists um, don't care about the impact of the policies they're proposing on jobs and environmentalists arguing that labor puts its short-term job interest ahead of saving a planet that really looks like it's in, in big trouble. So as long as we allow these wedges to divide us, we are not going to make any progress solving either the climate crisis or the economic crisis. Together, I think we can present a really powerful front, and that means we have to learn how to talk about these difficult issues together, and that's part of what we're going to be doing here tonight. Um, it's also uh, our goal, I think, to take advantage of the opportunity we've got right now in Oregon. We have a, an economic crisis that, that persists in spite of everything we've been able to figure out to do. The unemployment rate is still 8%. Um, we have uh, um, uh, climate issues that are huge that aren't getting addressed. I don't know if you've all been following the Rio plus 20 no, negotiations that are going on. That's not going very well. So um, we need to think about grabbing this opportunity to really do something together. The governor has just um, in, has just uh, released his draft 10-year energy plan. How many of you have had a chance to take a look at that? There's a, in, in all of that pile of material which you got when you came in, there's a, a, a website where you can go to download it. And I'd urge you to take a look at it. It's got clear implications both for reducing carbon emissions and also for creating jobs over the next 10 years, and we really need to be on that and giving, giving input into that plan and then helping to make sure it gets implemented. So our hope tonight is that through the several excellent presentations um, and some open dialogue, we're going to be able to identify some concrete next steps that, that you all might want to work on together. Um, you've all got an agenda in your packet, and I just want to take a minute to show you what we're going to do. So this is, it should be on the top of your packet. Um, uh, I'm going to introduce Jeremy, he'll give our keynote address, <coughs> we've been calling it that, but that's really what it is, and then uh, Jana Gastelum and Ben Nelson will respond from an environmental and a labor perspective, and then we're going to have um, breakout sessions on three topics, energy, renewable energy, um, weatherization and efficiency issues, and transportation. We'll break into three groups, um, have a little bit more in-depth conversation about the kinds of policies that are being considered or might be considered in those areas that would also create good jobs. Then we'll come back together to report out and think a little bit about next steps. Are there next steps you're interested in? Are there And, and are there next steps that have to do with policy or also relationship building? Because, I mean, part of this is our ability to figure out how to work together. So um, that's the deal, and we'll be done at 8.30. So that's the agenda. Um, the food is here. Feel free to get up and wander back and, and get food. Um, any questions before I get going? No, good, OK. I'm going to just start and introduce our first speaker. So Jeremy Hayes. Um, we are really lucky to have Jeremy here. Jeremy is the chief strategist for state and local initiatives of Green for All. 
which <laughs> this is really a mouthful, but yeah. he can handle it. Um, green for All is an organization whose mission is to build an inclusive green economy that's strong enough to lift people out of poverty. And um, Jeremy focuses on local efforts, like things we're doing here in Portland that I'm sure he and, and Jenna and Ben will talk about, and then he takes those models around the country to try to help implement them in other parts of the, of the country. Um, I, I met Jeremy in 2008, I guess, um, when, that long ago, when Jeremy was the, 2006, was the National Organizing Director for the Apollo Alliance, and, and Jeremy actually created the Apollo Alliance here in Portland. Um, uh, and so he's been doing this coalition building work for some time. Um, Jeremy was also instrumental in uh, putting together the Community Workforce Agreement for Clean Energy Works Portland. Um, and, and now cheer, you chair the board, right, for Clean yeah. Energy Works Oregon. Um, so he's, he's immersed in what's going on in Portland, and then he's running around the country telling everybody else how great you do things here. And we are really lucky that Jeremy lives in Portland because he's been quite an inspiration to a lot of us. So, Thanks, Barbara. I'm also lucky I live in Portland. I live right over there in Portland, so I could bike here, um, which is nice. I get in some bike to work miles. I, uh, I have a home office, actually. I was kind of grandfathered into Green for All, which is based in Oakland and Washington, D.C. So I have a home office over near the Baghdad Theater, kind of um, in southeast. And then all, all the people on my team that work for me actually work down in Oakland. So I don't get a chance to bike to work. I either shuffle around the corner from the kitchen or I get on an airplane and fly down there. <laughs> so this is nice. Um, so let me see. How many folks, in the, I'm just trying to get a sense. I recognize a number of faces in here and, um, and have a sense that this is not like a newbie crowd. So I'm just going to do a quick poll here. How many people think um, climate change is a problem? Okay, cool. How many people think uh, you know lack of quality jobs and, and uh, rising social inequity is a problem? All right, cool. Um, how many <laughs> and how many folks think that those two may be related to each other somehow? Okay, great, cool. All right, I'm done with my talk. <laughs> All right, well then I can jump. I can jump over to the good stuff. Um, and maybe I'll start with a story. So some of this stuff is has been incredibly obvious for a long time and we could um, I'm not a great numbers person and, and uh, in a short talk like this with I don't know I didn't do a lot of numbers but I think on the flyer for this there was a good quote from Rich Trumka that was like um, that said you know addressing climate risk means retooling our world just sort of rebuilding everything around us and we talk about like what are the jobs that you know could be created by addressing climate change in some real way it's like well what what aren't the jobs that could be created, right? Everywhere you look, or there's a couple examples in the room. Maybe one thing that some, you know, we could get some more people employed doing something that would take a, that would help reduce carbon emissions. Yeah. Rail. What's that? Rail. Rail. More rail could build more rail and put people to work doing that. Yes. A rational bridge plan over the Columbia. Oh, a bridge plan that made sense and worked. Yeah. Retrofitting houses and commercial buildings. Retrofitting houses and commercial buildings to lower their energy use. A couple of heaters. Get rid of that heater, replace it with something else, preferably manufactured here in the state, installed by somebody making good union wages, right? Retrofitting multifamily housing as well. Retrofitting multifamily housing. So there are a ton of things that, like, to a crowd like this are pretty obvious, right? It's like there's no mystery, and we're not in sort of the world of climate deniers. And um, who was it that was I was talking to earlier that was talking about Heartland and the Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber ads? Yeah, right? I mean... <laughs> Fortunately, we're not in that world. Where, but I saw that. I saw that. Um, that while it was up, I happened to be in Chicago when uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. The Heartland Institute, this right wing. They're not even a think tank. They're kind of like a don't think tank. Um, <laughs> this right wing climate deniers group, and they put up a, a poster that was trying to equate people that believed in climate change with um, the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. Right? They had a picture of him up, and there's a big billboard over the freeway in Chicago. I'm just like, what the? Hell? What is going on? <laughs> So we're not there, we're in Portland, that's nice. But um, let, me, let me start with this story and just talk about how things were going really well and how we began to work together. When I say we, I mean labor and enviros and community groups and some businesses began to work together really well, began to build a lot of power, probably more power than we were used to having, and how all that fell apart. And, and so that's a sad story. And then I'll, I'll end with just a couple of ideas of how we can begin putting it back together and why we have to begin putting it back together here in Portland or here in Oregon because it's not happening in Washington, D.C. 
anybody notice how messed up that town is? <laughs> so here's here's a story, and it's just um, and it's pretty straightforward. In 2000. Five, six, seven, as the country was kind of moving um, towards the idea that we could do something about climate change, we might actually move some federal policy that would bring us in line with some of the international accords that have been negotiated to date. There was this growing sense and growing work that as we did something about climate change, we would be able to create a lot of high quality jobs in the process. And not just, not just any old jobs, but really high quality jobs where people could um, live the American dream, you know, buy a house, put their kids through college, sustain themselves into their retirement, etc. And not only that, but that these new jobs that could be created by fixing some of the problems that the old economy had created would be available to folks who had been locked out of previous economic booms, right? So we get these pathways out of poverty or pathways to prosperity by doing, you know, specific entry-level jobs and training programs, and Ben's going to be able to talk about this in some specific um, examples, but bring people into the workforce and into quality jobs um, in a way that, that they hadn't had an opportunity to crack into before. And that idea sort of started to get, get a little traction and um, started to kind of buzz, and it got, a, you know, it's, it got named. It was like, oh, they're green jobs or green collar jobs or something like that, which is just sort of a nice phrase that encapsulated this basic idea that everybody in here is nodding their heads to that yes, we can create jobs and opportunity while we put our collective effort into reducing carbon emissions so we don't totally bake the planet and, and sort of kill ourselves either slowly or by degrees, or, slow, or quickly or by degrees. Um, that, that coalition that came together sort of around that idea of opportunity um, was extraordinarily powerful and came really, really, really close to helping pass the climate bill in 2009. Folks remember that at all in, at the federal congressional level. And there were just a lot of people that were working that from a lot of different angles. There were the traditional environmentalists who pulled out all the stops and created the um, unsophisticated and, um, war room that was staffed and uh, lots of collaboration going along around among the traditional enviros. They were cooperating really well with the labor unions who were able, who were who were looking very specifically at the types of jobs and the types of tweaks within the climate policy that might be able to give the union movement a boost. Working very closely with, it was a group called the Climate Equity Alliance that brought together a lot of anti-poverty <coughs> groups and the Congressional Black Caucus to bring in more people from that side. And that group was able to put together a pretty good bill that passed the House of Representatives under Nancy Pelosi's leadership and missed the Senate by that one vote that's been, that had been hurting us ever since. You know what I'm talking about? That, for the folks who oppose us and our agenda of, um, equality, income equality, right, wealth equality, as well as having a, a planet that's livable, that was way too close for comfort. Way too close for comfort. Somebody from the Heritage um, Foundation, you know that group? It's another right wing, don't think tank. Um, the Heritage Foundation stood up at a conference shortly after that and said, basically said, he didn't say like, that was close, but this is what he meant. He said, we defeated the climate bill. The next step is to destroy the myth of green jobs. Mm -hmm. right, they put that on their website. My friend Van was <coughs> joking about this recently. Van Jones, who started the organization that I work for now, was uh, somebody was saying to him, Van, what are you going to do about this vast right-wing conspiracy to you know, attack green jobs? And he's like, it's not a conspiracy. A conspiracy is when you keep it a secret and you don't tell anybody. No. Heritage put it right on the front of their website. <laughs> we are going to destroy the myth of green jobs. right? And they poured lots of money into that. And they paid lots of folks, and they started to foment some um, suspicion about whether or not these green jobs are real. Well, where are they all? Why haven't they all just suddenly popped up, you know, kind of playing on people's heightened expectations that they would suddenly be, you know, you would just, you wouldn't even have to apply. They would just come knock at your door and be like, we need you for the green economy. Please come to work. Um, but I think that was effective. And what we've seen is that, especially with the downturn in the, in the economy, as things got harder, Labor and Enviro and, and our friends in the civil rights community and to some extent the clean energy businesses, instead of turning to each other as things got rough, we sort of turned on each other a little bit, right? We, started, we got into some fights about stuff that probably weren't worth getting into a fight about. Anybody, well, maybe they were worth getting into a fight about. But can anybody name a fight, a recent fight that really has pushed, um, especially the blue-green coalition apart? Keystone XL. Yeah. Keystone XL pipeline was a terrible situation to be in, and I think there are very reasonable arguments on both 
sides of that. But from my perspective, of having built these coalitions for a long time and essentially watched like 10 years of work with labor and enviros kind of get flushed down the toilet over that, over whatever that was, 20,000 jobs, 80,000 jobs, the tar sands pipeline, the bay, whatever it was, it was the wrong conversation for us to be having at that time. When you and your friends go out and um, try to get something done and a bunch of bullies show up and beat up on you, right? The thing to do is to like retreat, regroup, maybe grab another couple friends and go back out, right? It's not that everybody run back to their own house and start thinking about, oh, the reason we got beat was because so-and-so didn't do that, so-and-so and this. So I think that it's really good that we're here um, tonight to begin having the conversation about what, that looks, what it looks like to carry this forward here in Oregon. There are tons of opportunities, and Janet and Ben are going to talk a little bit about, about some of them, but what I want to just say is give like a couple of quick lessons maybe, or a couple of quick observations about what's worked in these coalitions, because we've seen, we still, stuff is bad in D.C., and at the national level it's bad, but still around the country, groups of trade unions, um, organized labor, environmentalists, civil rights groups, business community, community-based groups of all kinds are still coming together to work out the solutions. And actually, we've taken a big hit, and the right wing has been effective, and we've sort of hurt ourselves a little bit, and we've taken a hit in terms of the way that the public perceives our issues. You know, that, like, the amount of people who feel like climate change is an important issue for Congress to address has been cut in half just since 2009. Half. I think it was, like, pulling at, like, 30% thought it was important, now it's down to, like, 17 think it's important, right? The number of people that actually believe climate change is real has gone down in the last three years. It's like the science, the evidence is getting more and more clear, but that number has gone down. So we've had a little bit of trouble, but the interesting thing about the polling is if you do it on a national level and you kind of talk about D.C. and you talk about green jobs and these issues and the ability to create jobs by addressing the climate crisis, people don't have a lot of faith or confidence in that. But when you start giving people specific examples in their own states or in their own communities, when people can begin to visualize the worker or the site, they immediately, it immediately clicks. Because this stuff is pretty obvious, right? We can take it out of the ideological debates. It's pretty clear that if we're going to build more rail lines, we're going to need to put more people to work. If we're going to retrofit more homes, we're going to need more workers to go in and retrofit homes. Do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, is anybody following those people that live on that island that's just gradually going to all go underwater? Uh, have you forgotten their name? Tuvalu and the Maldives. The Maldives. Yeah. Maldives. How far is it that the water is up to them? I don't know, but I know that, I don't know, and maybe, Jenny, you can do that. There's, there's a great documentary out there on it. The president of that country has been out doing some work for all of it. It's, they're, they're in dire straits. Yeah. yeah. That's not a lot of us. I mean, there's, um, and maybe we, well, yeah. <laughs> the waters are rising everywhere. And, uh, you know, I mean, there are, it's interesting. Like, the whole San Francisco airport needs to be moved because of climate change, right? The whole airport. Like, can't have it there anymore. Sorry, because within 40 or 50 years, the runways will be underwater. Move. That's San Francisco. That's not a small island out in the Pacific or something. So. The threats are real. <clears throat> Jen will talk more about that. Let me just say three quick things in closing about how these, how I've seen these things work at a, at a local level. And they're, they're somewhat obvious, but I think as, as this room begins to build strong relationships with each other and then go out and sort of bring some more people in, there's just a few things that, are, um, that have really worked over and over again. One is to remember that um, the best political alliances are built on real relationships and real people knowing each other, right? And it takes a little bit of extra work to figure out, you know, how to go out and just um, do the political work, but also do the work of getting to know each other's stories. For many folks in here that come from a, from a community organizing school that practices one-on-ones and storytelling narratives and stuff, so you know the power of that. And that is really important in all the work that we do. And sometimes we forget that, like, that's something important to do when I'm, like, knocking doors in the neighborhood. And then I don't do that when I'm like in a trying to form a coalition or I'm working with other leaders. And it's just as important or more important to get to know people's stories and know where they're coming from and sort of what moves them to these issues. Um, the other thing is to, I think, to focus on the stuff that we agree on. This seems obvious, right? Agree on what we agree on and leave the other stuff out. That's often really hard for us because we're pretty passionate people and we have a worldview that we feel pretty confident about. It's sort of frustrating when other people don't share that worldview. 
getting to know people will help, right, as real human beings and understanding what in their experience brought them to their own world view. But then just agreeing that, like, here's the stuff that we agree on, and this is what we're going to work with. And they're real concrete things. It's specific policies. It's a specific number of jobs and other things. Because we can't have a serious negotiation about concepts or theory because we have different opinions about concepts and theory, right? Like if you two were going to, let's just, let's just use them as stereotypes and pretend they're not the If labor and environmentalists were going to sit down and say, what are we going to do about, you know, this particular project that's, that needs, you know, we need to protect this habitat and shut down this plant that's going to do these jobs, for example, some old thing, right? You would imagine that in the abstract people get very uncomfortable with that, but as you begin to drill down the very specifics, we're talking about this many jobs, we're talking about these mitigation strategies, we're talking about you know, this chunk of habitat, you can begin to have real conversations. Anyway, and the third thing is that the commitments are sticky. They're, both sides have been bad at this, but, um, uh, and, and you all can think of your own horror stories, but the commitments that we make to each other have to be real and have to be long lasting. Nothing hurts a political effort more than having people say, we're with you, we're with you, we're together, we're together, and it gets the 11th hour, and the bad guys start pushing really hard, and somebody breaks, right? And everything falls apart. That, that takes years and years to repair. And, the, and there's no other way of getting to sticky commitments except for by staying like, this commitment is sticky. I promise that in the 11th hour, when it gets really hard, and there's a lot of folks breathing down my neck, I will still be with you. Um, and I think that'll go a long way, because we're still patching up stuff that happened seven, ten years ago from somebody making a bad decision, you know, in the heat of the moment. So anyway, I hope that's uh, at least useful for a conversation starter. And I want to turn either back to Barbara or back over to our other, other folks to talk more about how to take this conversation forward here. Thank you, Jeremy. going to do questions and answers, but we'll wait until the other two folks have spoken, and then we'll get back to that. So um, that was really useful. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker we have that we're um, also really lucky to have with us, especially because if we planned this for him a couple weeks later, she might not have been available, <laughs> so, is Jana Gastelum. I, I, and I want to do a shout out. Jana's mom and dad are here, Ed and Carolyn. <laughs> And, we're, and we're, we really are glad you're here. <laughs> so Jana is the program director for climate protection at the Oregon Environmental Council. I guess you have to have long titles if you're going to do this work. Okay. So, and, and Jana leads OEC's work to implement climate solutions. She does it in Portland. She does it in Salem. Um, she's a very effective leader in that, in that arena. And she also chairs the Healthy Climate Partnership, which is a coalition of environmentalists and labor and business and, and public <coughs> figures and lots of other folks show up at those meetings. Um, very educational. Probably if you're interested in that group, Jana can tell you how to get on the list. Um, uh, I think Jana is one of the people that has helped build and maintain coalitions in this, in this Portland metro area. And so um, in addition to how smart she is on climate, she's really good at the coalition work too. So Jana, thanks. And go ahead. Well, thank you for the And I, I do want to pick up on those two themes because really, when I, I, I've been in Portland for two and a half years, so you guys are all more experts probably on, on Oregon than I am. But when I first arrived, one of the first people that I was lucky enough to meet who extended a hand was Barbara. And so early on, it was that reaching out and forming those relationships. And I've always, always really appreciated that. And it, it built on the good work that OEC had previously done. Oh, a little louder? All right. Uh, I was just thanking Barbara for extending a hand first when I first arrived to <laughs> Portland. And that, that really did form you know, a very solid relationship that we were able to, to build on. So my job tonight is to sort of quickly do a snapshot on climate science. But I know this is a pretty informed group, so I'm going to keep that part short. And then talk about some of the solutions that we're also working on and some of the collaboration. Um, so, many of you may have realized that, we, this was just in the news recently, but we just hit a really important climate milestone. And that was hitting 400 parts per million of CO2 into the atmosphere. And that's really the big, big climate driver that's out there that we have to really be concerned about. So basically, pre-industrial levels of CO2 in the atmosphere were about 275 parts per million. 
It took about a little over 100 years to go a, a little over 100 parts per million up. And the last 30 years after that, they would go even faster. So by the time my little girl's about my age, those emissions will have jumped to about 500 parts per million. And that gets into really serious consequences. We're already starting to feel those climate impacts now. And what that means, um, someone mentioned the Maldives, but we can look at our own backyard. So here in Oregon, the, the two impacts that I think probably resonate the most with people are our water and our air. So most people in Oregon are dependent on mid-level snowpack for our summer water supply. And that <laughs> mid-level snowpack hovers around 32 degrees Fahrenheit, right? That's, that's about freezing point. So a small shift in temperature has a big impact on our summer water supply. So that's why we care a whole lot for agriculture, for urban uses, um, for the health of our forests, for our overall economy. That's a really important piece. And the other one is health. Our air quality also is somewhat temperature dependent. And even though Oregon overall is a green state, we actually have pretty bad air quality in certain areas. And the higher those temperatures go, the worse smog gets. We're one of the number one states for asthma rates, especially in um, adult populations. That costs our state something like $28 million a year in lost productivity and increased health costs. And so the more we worsen our air quality, the bigger the costs and those burdens are. So there are multiple, multiple reasons for addressing climate. One is, is our health, um, but two is also the opportunity it presents us because we do have to retool to make sure we get to that clean future. Also, ESCO in the neighborhood, Northwest neighborhood, they're working on it. Yeah, yeah. So <coughs> one, of, one of the things that I've loved about um, coming into this Portland community, Barbara mentioned is the Healthy Climate Partnership, was, which is kind of a coalition that I inherited to help facilitate. But we really look for those collaborative solutions. And so along the way, some of the things that we've worked on, um, I'll go back just two years in the legislative session, was an energy efficiency package. It was the Jobs and Prosperity Campaign. And we looked at how do we continue to accelerate energy efficiency work in the state because we know that's a quick way to get good local jobs is also very important for the climate. Um, and we had a broad base of support behind it. We also had a 30-30 split in the legislature, which was not entirely possible to overcome, but we were able to make progress on a certain part of that agenda, which was the governor's cool school mm -hmm. bill, which was very helpful and I think we'll continue to be able to build on that. Um, OEC as an organization has also worked on looking at um, not just saying no to things, so we have a program on toxics, um, but also what we say yes to. And so we have a green chemistry program that says, let's figure out how to, how to replace the bad stuff with good stuff, and especially good stuff that's made here in Oregon. And so we try and look more holistically at a lot of those problems. Um, on the climate front, I wanted to just sort of quickly uh, touch on two initiatives that we're working on. And there's, um, in your handout, there's a brochure or one-page sheet on something called the Clean Fuels Program. And this is the idea that um, we spend between five and six and a half billion dollars a year on importing oil and gasoline and diesel into the state. If we're able to divert a portion of those dollars onto clean fuel investments in the state, we get multiple, multiple benefits. Transportation needs a lot of infrastructure, and infrastructure requires a lot of jobs. So we're modeling this program after work that's been done in California. There's also a northeastern effort to work on this. But basically what it does, it says, we need to invest in the infrastructure that's going to give us cleaner fuels, advanced biofuels, um, the Pacific Ethanol has a plant out in the Boardman area that was union built. We'd love to see more of that happen. Electric vehicles, um, potentially some, some larger trucks could be converted to natural gas. So what's sort of the, the bigger, broader mix of clean fuels that we can bring to the state? And most importantly, how do we take those dollars that are currently flying out the door and reinvest them here locally? So that's a program that we're very excited about and we would love, you know, 
other people's participation and help thinking about how best to design that program. Rulemaking is happening this summer, and then in, in, the, uh, in January, there'll be some legislative work to be done on it as well. Did you hear about House Bill 3939, I think it is, the eighth bill or something like that, <coughs> about um, uh, halting all uh, mountain removal until it is thoroughly uh, uh, researched as to what, what the effects are on people and it'll probably be pretty bad. Yeah. Uh, I, I haven't, but I'd Dennis, love to talk to you about yeah, it. Dennis Gosage and a lot of other people in. Oh, great. Great. And then we'll, we'll continue to do questions at the uh, Thank you, end as well. No, no problem. I actually really appreciate enthusiasm because <laughs> some days it does get hard. We work on these problems and it feels like there are more enemies out there than supporters. And yeah, so, she's doing this stuff. Great. Um, the last thing I wanted to touch quickly on, um, also at the back of your handout, is um, <coughs> I think there's a lot that Oregon can do, but I think we're even better off if we have regional and national efforts around these programs. And so I included um, a snapshot of a report on the West Coast clean economy. So we've been working regionally with um, California, um, our governor here, the governor of Washington, and British Columbia under something called the Pacific Coast Collaborative to think about how we build a regional West Coast clean economy network. And this report was commissioned, and it does, it does two things. One, it confirms what we've known all along, despite what the Heritage Foundation says. We have clean energy green jobs now, and we want to protect those jobs. No one should take away what we already have. Those jobs are here, they're real, and they pay well, and we should keep doing more. But we also need to accelerate what we're doing and create more opportunities overall. And so this report says that by 2020, we have the opportunity to create an additional 1 million green jobs. But it's going to take effort and it's going to take collaboration. And it outlines a number of sectors where we have a great opportunity. And what's, what's excellent is actually they also do a little snapshot on state reports. And what's, well, what's great is that we are recognized for a lot of the innovation we've done. Um, they call out... Um, Clean Energy Works as a program that should be replicated across the region, as well as some of the work on with the United Streetcar and manufacturing of um, transit, things like that. So we have a lot of good examples in Oregon, and we need to keep telling people about our successes so we make sure to replicate them. Um, and I think we do have a great opportunity in front of us with the Governor's 10-Year Energy Plan to figure out where we really can take hold of the most immediate opportunities. Mm -hmm. Because it's true, there are forces out there that are aligned against us, and I'm willing to bet that the same ones that are into um, discrediting unions are probably the same ones who also are discrediting environmental ideas as well. And so we are much, much stronger together than, um, than breaking over the, the less significant things. So again, I really appreciate being here. And, um, it obviously matters to me a great deal what our future looks <laughs> like. I, I want a strong, healthy environment and a strong, healthy Oregon economy as well. Thanks. Thank you, Jenna. Um, so our last speaker is Ben Nelson. Ben is an organizer for the, this is another one of these titles, for the Northwest Region Organizing Coalition of the Laborers International Union of North well, that's America. That's the organization, organizer. <laughs> 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 um, and he's a great organizer. <laughs> so Ben helped develop the High Road um, Contractor and Community Alliance, HERCA, what's known as HERCA to its friends, which is with the aim of which is to raise standards for workers in the weatherization industry. It's um, uh, the contractors who are part of HERCA uh, do work under the Clean Energy Works Oregon program. Um, ben also sits on the High Road Committee for Clean Energy Works Oregon and has been very influential in, in making sure I think that, that workers' voices are heard in all this conversation about how do we do weatherization work in the city. Um, Ben is a, a really a coalition builder, and he's been he's been key in a lot of the efforts here in in Portland to pull unions into conversation with folks from the community, people of color, low income, um, and contractors to talk about how can we all work together to do this energy efficiency work. So, Ben.
Thank you, Barbara. Uh, thanks, everybody, for coming out on a beautiful, uh, it's almost summer evening. And, uh, summer now. Is it summer now? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're spending it together. All right. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, just mention briefly, um, uh, what I think is a piece of labor perspective that people might find helpful. I want to talk about a couple of examples of things um, that our union has been working on, and it's directly related to what Barbara was just talking about, teeing it up for me just right, um, and it's the residential energy efficiency work, and probably touch a little bit on uh, the governor's 10-year energy plan um, and maybe some opportunities in there. So um, on that first piece, I think it's important for folks to remember, or I'd like to, uh, we, Jeremy talked about when things get hard, people split apart. And um, it's just, it, we find ourselves in a difficult spot. And I don't want to make any excuses for uh, unions supporting things that seem uh, to, what we know are causing uh, climate issues and contributing to the problem. But I've always feel, felt like, and continue to feel like, that the work we're doing here is so critical to answer that question because we have to have viable options for workers. And when you're a labor leader and you're the head of a local union or you know, a regional a, a leader, the members are your friends and coworkers and people you're in the field with and work with for years, and we've got a, an incredible employment uh, uh, employment crisis. And I'm, I'm from a construction union, um, and we've seen anywhere from 20, 30, 40, maybe as high as 50 percent unemployment in the last few years. So these uh, union leaders are faced with every day people with concerns. They're uh, can't make their mortgage payments and they may be getting foreclosed on. Their health care has run out and they can't get your kids to the doctor. And so they've got these immediate needs um, and, it, and I understand it's not an excuse for, you know, uh, taking us down that path, but it's just a perspective um, that I just, it's just really, it's really understandable to see why people make those decisions. And the answer is having good op options for working folks and hopefully out of this uh, meeting we'll be able to um, you know, develop some more ideas about how we move forward and, and uh, create more of those job opportunities um, uh, so that we, you know, can make smart decisions about the work that we do. So with that in mind, a couple of things that we've been doing um, that I think fit into that. Uh, the Laborers Union has been working on a, for a few years on a national uh, residential energy efficiency campaign. Um, and it's been, uh, it's been fits and starts in some areas of success and some not so successful areas. Fortunately for me, I work here in Oregon, and uh, we've put together a program uh, that's a model for the rest of the country, a uh, Clean Energy Works uh, Oregon program. Uh, it's been mentioned a couple times. Are folks in the room familiar with that program and how it works? Show of hands if you've heard about it. Okay, so real quick, it's, um, it's a stimulus-funded nonprofit uh, working in Oregon uh, to help people, kind of a platform and one-stop shopping for homeowners who want to get their home retrofitted. And so you're, it's, it helps to bring together the rebates that they uh, themselves offer for the stimulus money. It brings in the ETO incentives, uh, connects you with contractors and embedded, and uh, makes it uh, really simple for it. That connects people with financing. Uh, it's intended to remove some of the stumbling blocks that people have in their energy efficiency upgrade searches. And uh, um, What's ETO? the Energy Trust of Oregon. So they've got uh, um, a number of uh, uh, programs available for um, uh, rebates and whatnot. So uh, Clean Energy Works uh, has been working for about a year. We'll unfortunately have Jeremy as the uh, board chair uh, to bring those opportunities um, to folks. So we've retrofitted uh, 1,600 homes uh, approximately in Oregon. Uh, the goal is to retrofit uh, 6,000 mm -hmm. and to build something that stands alone and kind of moves beyond the grant period. Mm -hmm. um, I, the, one of the key pieces of <coughs> Clean Energy Works of Oregon uh, is the Community Workforce Agreement that was mentioned earlier. It was uh, originally the Community Workforce Agreement, now they call it the High Road Standards. It's uh, uh, negotiated with a lot of community stakeholders and it sets higher standards for wages, uh, benefits, health care, Training opportunities, inclusiveness, making sure that these green, this green job generation mechanism finds a diverse uh, group in the community. And I think that it's really important for us to remember as we move forward and look at uh, new ideas and opportunities 
then we've got to include uh, community workforce agreements, uh, project labor agreements, or community benefit agreements uh, into these programs. I think uh, we can, when people start to pick apart the 10-year energy plan, that's what I want us to be thinking about is how are we, what's our strategy we keep in mind to make sure that these are good jobs on the back end? Because uh, a whole bunch of, you know, it's, it's only going to work for the community if they're sustainable jobs, accessible to everybody, and they have career opportunities. Um, so as part of running parallel to the Clean Energy Works program, we started this uh, HERCA, the High Road Community Contractor Alliance. Um, I think it's a real example that we can look to um, as in other industries and other opportunities. It's a nonprofit that was uh, started by uh, work with for-profit contractors, small businesses, local businesses, laborers union, uh, Metropolitan Alliance for Common Good, uh, the Sierra Club, and Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. Mm -hmm. Folks decided, let's get together. We're going to do community organizing, community education, and uh, steer people toward the Clean Energy Works program or some other retrofit uh, opportunity for them if they need it. Um, and it's intended to help support um, the small businesses and then provide that organizing uh, piece that's so important. Uh, people in participating in this work is really meaningful for folks. It's a jobs program, it's potential cost savings, it's reducing your carbon footprint, it's improving the value of your home. Uh, folks may not realize all these opportunities. So uh, these organizations got together and said, let's work together to get into the community, talk to our members about it, and uh, we can really help build this market. And uh, they agree that they're going to do it at a higher standard than even the community workforce agreement, high road standards. It's going to be all union work, and we're going to steer folks to the laborers. Um, and so that's out on the street. Um, there's a flyer in your packets. Weatherize for Good is the campaign. There's the website, weatherizeforgood.org. Uh, HERCA is the uh, organization. If you want to be part of that, you got a house that needs some work. Uh, you can talk to Michael. He had some work done. It worked well for him. Uh, uh, we got more than uh, a couple of folks in here who work with HERCA. Uh, Michael uh, volunteered with MACG, I was in the Sierra Club. Uh, all critical folks helping to. Um, keep that organization going. Um, one other example I want to raise, just real quickly, is a project in Washington that I'm also part of and our union has worked with. Uh, it's called Sustainable Works. It's another nonprofit. It's another model we might be able to use um, that does connects both the, it's the same concept. It's a little packaged a little bit differently. Uh, it's got community organizing and education, neighborhood by neighborhood. People are canvassing, knocking on doors, having house uh, parties. Uh, and then they also act as a general contractor. Um, and I think that, you know, that's the relationship building uh, that Jeremy mentioned that's so critical to getting people involved in these campaigns and then taking the step to get the work done. Um, last thing on the 10-year energy plan, um, this is all the residential <coughs> stuff. It's uh, important work. Uh, there's been Clean Energy Works has created to preserve somewhere around 150 jobs. Uh, the Sustainable Works program has probably created about 55 jobs. Well, we've got a lot of work to do. That's not going to cut it. Um, so we've really got to uh, get into the commercial sector, uh, into the industrial sector, and the public building sector. Uh, the 10-year energy plan calls for a state building innovation lab. Um, uh, they're auditing up to 4 million square feet of state-owned. They want to take that first step themselves. Uh, we need, to, I think, my message, we need to hold their feet to the fire, make sure this gets done, and have workforce standards in there. But they want to audit up to 4 million uh, square feet of state-owned buildings, <clears throat> uh, get in, start retrofitting them over the next 10 years, and then take what information they glean from that process and make it available to the private sector. Uh, so hopefully it will encourage uh, commercial industrial building owners to get involved and uh, be able to sort of take the step that they're not doing right now. And those are, I think, we'll start uh, realizing a lot of jobs in energy efficiency. If we can get into all of our public-owned buildings, um, continue with the cool schools program, also part of that 10-year plan is uh, to continue on with that. Um, I think that's some work that we can do collectively, maybe in uh, these breakouts we can talk about how we interact with the state and hold them accountable to these promises and uh, make some of this stuff real. Um, one last thing in that 10-year energy plan that I think is important for um, this work that we've been doing in energy efficiency is the energy performance score. Um, I'd like to you know, kind of talk about how we make that real. A failed in session is basically mileage for your home. And it's, it's if we make that mandatory for analysis of your home, uh, it's something that then feeds into the marketplace and it's value. 
you get your home retro bills mean something. It's dollars when you go to sell it. Uh, there's opposition to that, obviously, so hopefully uh, we can work together uh, to try and get uh, some form of that through the legislature, um, which I think will be a good driver for, for the industry. Um, again, thanks for having me. It's uh, a couple of things we've been working on. I always have to do this when Ben talks about the uh, HERCA. I had my home weatherized, and I used a union contractor that was referred to me by HERCA. And the, the crew that showed up to weatherize my house, it was four young women, all graduates of the Oregon Tradeswomen program. N none of them had ever had a family wage job before. And a young Latino male who was a graduate of the Portland Youth Builders program also had never had a family wage job before and they all showed up at my house and weatherized my house for me and it was it was a uh, it was fabulous and and by the way I'm saving a lot of money on my utility bills right now so um, thank you for doing that <laughs> it's just a personal testimony I'm sorry okay so we have about 15 minutes maybe for questions and answers and um, I'll, uh, let me, Barry, I'm going to see if there's anybody who hasn't spoken yet that wants to ask a question. And if, yeah, go ahead, Michael. I've got a comment to make. Um, my name is Michael Human. I'm a leader with the Metropolitan Alliance for Common Good, but professionally I'm an epidemiologist, and I want just to remind folks that health impacts from climate change are real. Um, uh, asthma was mentioned as one of the uh, impacts from air quality problems. Uh, that affects workers the same that it affects our children and our loved ones in our lives. And it's very, very real. In addition to that, as the climate is warming up, um, when we have heat waves, that probably takes more lives every year across this country than any other natural disaster. And it's something that we've got to be aware of. When we do the things that we're talking about here tonight, we actually begin to make a difference. We begin to cool things down a little bit. We begin to clean up the air a little bit. Everything is connected. And it's really important. The second point I wanted to make, and I don't, no response is necessary, does it, is actually, but when we think about using union labor for home projects, you can always get it done cheaper from somebody who's paying his workers less. But there's a downside to that, and that is those workers don't have a living wage, that they're struggling just to make ends meet, um, which is really a difficult thing. And for many people who are aware of buying their coffee or their chocolate, fair traded, this is the same sort of concept. It is paying a fair wage and a living wage to those people who are our neighbors or our neighbor's children uh, to make this happen. And in that certain sense, it's an attitude change that we have to make. And that extra fair traded amount really goes to support our own community. It really goes to help build lives in our community. So just keep those in mind. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to ask you, uh, you said that there was uh, and an organization, I think it was, or an agency um, out of D.C. called Sustainable Work. So you said? Washington State. Just oh, Washington State. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, sustainableworks.org. Oh, okay. You can uh, okay. check out their website. Um, they got funded through some block grant money uh, a couple of years ago. And, um, mm -hmm. They buy down the cost of the for the where folks use that money for the community organizing and they buy down the cost. But um, they're operating the Puget Sound and Spokane area, and it's something that the organization our union has been working with. They do all their all their work union. Okay. I want to take more questions, but let me let me just make one quick announcement. Um, the food in the back was all sort of paid for out of the pockets of the planning committee. <laughs> so we're going to pass the hat while we're while we finish the Q and A. Dave's got the hat back there, and. Uh, so you, so you'll recognize Dave. He's not just anyone asking you for money. <laughs> Dig deep. Okay. Um, yeah, Eric. Yeah. Uh, for you, uh, the last speaker, uh, I forgot your name. Ben. Ben. Okay. Ben Nelson. Ben. Uh, isn't our time right now just very, very similar to the 1930s and Roosevelt? <laughs> well, I remember it well. <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it. I mean, there's a lot of people talking about the need for, uh, you know, a new New Deal, um, and getting us, you know, starting to spend our way out of this, um, this depression we're in. And, uh, I think there's a lot of agreement probably this room. I'm trying to say it's like the New Deal, progress administration, Tennessee Valley Authority, all those programs. Those were needs, and our president said, we're going to take a certain amount of money out of our treasury. We're, we're going to make that up, make 
up that money to pay these people. The same thing can be done now as is done with wars. Well, we could have the WPA, the retrofitted homes, you know. Hire an army of... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a next step. Clean our oceans, too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Steve. So, Jeremy, what's the state of rebuilding the blue-green uh, uh, alliance at this point? Well, um... So there are two, there's a Blue Green Alliance with capital letters. It's an actual organization, yeah, yeah. right? And so we won't talk about them because I don't. The little B. The little B and the, and the little G, Blue Green Alliance. Um, it's slow going right now, unfortunately. I think that there are, uh, there's a combination. Um, there's some hurt feelings on, on both sides. And, you know, these things are sort of personal at a certain point. When folks don't intentionally, as I was saying, sort of make them personal from the beginning and then something kind of goes sideways in the course of politics, I think people still get personally offended. And um, so I think there's some, there, there's, some, uh, there's, some, it, there's some trust issues that we need to build back up again. But perhaps even more importantly, or at least something that would really help get over, you know, or reform some of that trust would be just some some bold and smart forward momentum on some of these initiatives. And I think at the national level, uh, it's just a lot harder to knit this stuff together at the national level um, because people feel so beholden to what they understand as their base, which is vast and kind of, you know, kind of gets all blurred together. You know, it's like, well, my base, does, you know, feels this way and I've got it. Right now, it's really important for me to respect them because they're in a lot of pain right now. If we can begin to sort of trickle down until we can actually understand the names of each other's bases, mm -hmm. right? But we can talk to each other and try to figure out, you know, we recognize that we're hurting here and um, we need to find a way forward and we can do that together. I think these examples of bold action and courageous partnerships at the, at the state level and at the regional or local level are going to make it easier um, for folks at the national level to re -knit those ties over time. So again, I think it's really, it's really critical that these conversations are happening in this room and that people really get down to like, what are the specific things we're going to do together? Every concrete thing, it doesn't matter what it is, everything that we do together that is a step forward that we take together energizes us and prepares us for the next step. We can talk all day long, but that single step that we take together, it, that's, I mean, that's the real deal, that's where it's at. Uh, Lori and Jeff. Um, in line with um, you know knitting the alliance back together, um, one strategy might be, but a, a really hard one, is to focus together on the kind of jobs that people are talking about here, like climate jobs. Yep. And when it comes to being against fossil fuel type jobs, to just kind of lay off those issues, or at least not try and do them, not try and convince each other of that, yeah. but to keep focusing on um, climate jobs because that's something that is clearly... Yeah. Yeah. And, and then when it comes to the XL pipeline, allow, I mean, just realize that there's going to be differences of opinion there and just accept, and know that that's going to happen. I think it's very important to recognize that we're going to have differences of opinions yeah. and to find the things we can agree on and work on those first. Yeah. Um, I think it's very important to choose your battles yeah. across the board and choose ones that um, are smart for the long term and that you're thinking ahead about you know, the political constituencies and alliances that you're going to need to win big down the road. We are very funny species. I was reading an article. I think Judy sent me this article about retrenchment in D.C. Did you send me that? Yeah. Something about you know, D.C.'s group block. And there's just this offhand comment in there that I thought was so fascinating that Darwin said, we're one of the few species that when it gets threatened and it actually like we sort of turn back to what we know in the past and kind of cling to that as opposed to like diversifying and adapting and changing and kind of continuing to move forward. And I thought that was so interesting because it's so true whether it's like you know it's times of crisis and we're going to just you know like oh we've always pulled stuff out of the ground and burned it let's just keep doing that you know like tar sands or oil, sh you know, coal, shale gas, or whatever it is, you know. The other stuff is too hard, I can't think about it, even though the planet's baking us. Or the economy's down, our workers are laid off, they're really hurting, you know, our jobs are in danger as leaders because we're going to get tossed out or because we don't have enough money from our own constituencies. Let's just go back to what we know, right? Let's go back to, like, bread and butter issues, which, unfortunately, like, we eat different bread and butter at our different tables, you know. And we go back to our own tables and we just kind of taking a little step backwards from what has been a really promising coalition. 
all that stuff can be overcome with, with just continuing to be bold and courageous. And, you know, there's no better time than when you are sort of getting attacked a little bit to, to, um, to stand up and, and really fight back with some force. And that's what's happened to us. We got very strong. We were a very powerful coalition. The bad guys saw that, and they came right for us. And if we think anything else happened, we're fooling ourselves, and we're buying right into what they'd like us to think. Which, again, I just have to applaud the committee that put this event together, which was really, let's again think big, let's think bold, and let's think coalition. Where are the places we can come together? Because there are more opportunities there than a few issues that would actually divide us. Yeah. And so I can't, I can't applaud the, the committee more um, that, that put it together tonight. Yeah, you kind of answered my question here in your last comment. I mean, in the sense that you, you did come so close, and that's why you got flow back. That's why you got the resistance, because you were getting close to some real change. And it, it seems like that might start to happen again, especially when you have breakthroughs like uh, in solar panels, plastic solar panels, those will continue. What can we do differently to be ready for the bullback next time? And uh, uh, that's one part of my question. And then the second part of my question is, we know in Oregon that there's been some resurgence in manufacturing. In terms of that. That's one of the largest aspects of uh, private sector job growth in our state. Can we expand the definition of green jobs so that there's not this artificial separation? Is it really any job that's done in a factory in the United States more of a green job? Been done in many places internationally, and that anything we can do, no matter what the product is, well, no, I won't say that, but um, anything that we can do for a large, for a large majority of the products probably would be done more environment, in a more environmentally conscious <coughs> fashion here. And so the green job is only one component of having it, it has to be part of a healthy manufacturing infrastructure. It can't be. Uh, the investments in electronics and solar panels and that technology can't be separated into a small sliver of <coughs> green technology, I don't think, to, no, it's true. to maximize it, its potential. Yeah. Yeah, maybe if I can add to that, once a lot of people get into working on those green jobs, they get money coming in, they don't have money to spend yes. on these other things. Yeah, but to go back, I, sorry, we're on so long, but to go back, what can be done differently? The next time you hit that, that point, you have to put a blowback. Well, let me just say something about the manufacturing stuff because it is important. You know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics actually has counted all the green jobs in the country and came up with a number. There are 3.1 million green jobs in the country right now. That's without a climate bill and without, you know, national renewable portfolio standards and other things that really help juice that number. And interestingly, when you dig into the data, most of the green jobs are in manufacturing. Right. Most of the green jobs now are in manufacturing. These jobs aren't, you know, Buck Rogers, job, like, you know, you see it going down and say, oh, there's one of those green, green collar workers. You know, you can't tell from across the street, you know. Your electrician is a green collar worker on Thursday when you're wiring up the solar panels. Maybe you don't count the hours that way when they're wiring up your hot tub on Tuesday, you know. They're just, but it's the same person, right? And the same way when you're in a, when you're in a factory and you're making bolts and they're going to stand up wind turbines to get clean energy, you know, from natural resources. We'll count those hours. So it's um, it is important that the industries do span all the places. The more that we just demystify this stuff, you know, our, the organizations that I've worked for um, bear some of the responsibility for this green job thing getting out of hand. It's just an easy way of talking about the fact that we can like do right by the environment and create employment for folks that need it, right? And all of a sudden, everyone's like, "Well, show me the green job. Show me this." It's like, oh, you know. <laughs> They're just, you invest in smart things that are good for the planet, and then you get jobs. You know, you want me to draw you an exact straight line through a $13 trillion economy to connect a worker to an like this. So let's not get caught up in that, right? Um, what can we do to avoid this stuff next time? I think the single, Ben and Jan will have really good suggestions, and I'm going to be just a little pie in the sky. I think we just need to be more confident in ourselves. I think that as progressives in this country and as people that want change in this country, we suffer from this idea that like we either, you know, we couldn't possibly be that powerful or we maybe we don't deserve it or maybe, you know, we can't really be smart enough. But it's like we get pretty close and then we get so freaked out that we're about to win that we just like, you know, don't touch me, don't touch me, I'm about to win, you know, like, say that. 
And it's like, at that moment, when we're right there, that's the time to throw your arms around your neighbors and be like, we're going to walk through these gates together, folks. And, and we just miss that so many times. Employee free choice, right, should have been easy. Should have been just there for the taking, right, with the kind of coalition to put Obama into office. The, the climate bill was just, like, should have been done, and over and over again. And I think that we get... Get a little too freaked out when we get close to winning. And we start either get too technical or kind of drill down into the weeds or something weird happens. I'm not a psychologist and um, maybe you are and you can help answer this question, but but I think if we're just confident that like we deserve the victories that we've dreamed of and we have the power to achieve the victories that we dreamed of and we're gonna get there together, then we can just walk through those gates. And I think sometimes I have to, I hate to say it, but I do think we're our own worst enemies. There's a lot of other people that want to speak. There's just a lot of other people that want to speak. So why don't you go next? Okay. Okay. I'm Barbara Ellis. I represent Occupy's Coal Committee. Uh, it's it's a, uh, an alliance of river keeper, Columbia Riverkeeper, Greenpeace, and the uh, coal, the, uh, it's a community uh, against coal coming in here. Uh, we have three PR agencies in Portland who have picked up the contract from Big Coal. They are going to run eight trains a day through this town. Uh, I believe there are 120 gondolas and they're going to have to park the coal someplace else and you were talking about Asthma, uh, what are you all, what would you suggest, because there is a thing between unions and environmentalists, your guardian was talking about thousands of jobs will be here, and we counted up about 20 permanent jobs for Morrow, for St. Helens, for Longview, for uh, Cherry Point, and Westwood. I mean, thousands of jobs. So what would you suggest, as we were even canvassing beginning today against this, along those railroad tracks where those people are going to be for a mile and a half on either side, breathing all of that COVID. Yeah. So what, what uh, would you suggest uh, a coalition which is split between union and environmentalists do, to do just what we were talking about, working together. I, I haven't been, I've heard only tangentially about that coal export, which seems crazy. Um, seems crazy, <laughs> just like on the face of it. Blow up mountains in the, you know, in Appalachia, throw rocks on a train and drive them, put them on a boat to ship them off somewhere to burn them and put stuff in the sky. That's just insane. I, um, have you guys, have you all been part of this or have any suggestions about how to approach that? I think it is a really hard issue because it, I think everyone is sympathetic. Our poor communities are having a hard time, and everyone wants to support communities in Oregon. Um, but that being said, we want to do it the right way and with the best long-term benefits possible. And so I think it is very hard to think about taking a raw energy commodity, taking up our own rail capacity with that, and then exporting it. That's not probably the highest value use that we can get out of those resources. Um, but what, what's the alternative? What can we say yes to instead? And I think as a community, we do have to think about that collectively. Um, because because there are there is an offer on the table, and we understand that. We don't think it's a good offer on the table. Um, and I think that there was a whole rally um, back in May and, you know, the example came up that, you know, West Virginia has a lot of coal, but it's not our most prosperous state in the nation. Um, and coal doesn't always share its riches, you know, especially with, with the little guy. And so we need to look carefully at what the proposition is. But certainly from a climate perspective, I mean, coal is the worst of the worst that's out there. And we need to be very, very careful with how it's used. Um, and on the health standpoint, you know, we're doing a lot to think about how we transition our own energy mix here in Oregon to export 150 million tons of coal only to have a significant portion of that pollution blow back on us. <laughs> um, it's also not a winning scenario for our health. We're investing a lot, you know, in salmon recovery and mercury cleanup and pollution controls. 
And that actually comes back to us without any actual additional benefits for Oregon. So um, it's something that, that we think needs to be looked at very, very carefully and at least have environmental and health analyses done before we make big decisions on this. Uh, I, I feel like I have to jump into this yeah. and just say that um, the, there, there hasn't been any official action taken in Oregon um, to vote on resolutions or anything in the labor movement, but there has in Washington State, in the, the Washington AFL-CIO passed a resolution supporting the building of coal terminals. I guess the, it's the Bellingham terminal that they, that they were supporting. Um, here in Oregon, the building trades unions have already signed an agreement with Amber Energy, which is which is doing one of the one of the uh, terminals. And these and it's and it's like Ben said, these are unions, 30 to 50 percent of whose members are unemployed right now, yeah. and there aren't there aren't other options for them right now. Um, the other group, the other union that's supporting the coal terminal idea sort of tentatively right now is the Longshore and Warehouse Union, this militant left-wing union mm -hmm. that's out fighting the electoral um, polls, that, that fights for its jobs on the West Coast. Um, there are a lot of jobs for those workers that will be created by exporting coal. So you can yeah. see the dilemma, and this is not an easy dilemma for labor, and I think that what Jana is saying is really the right Thing, which is that we need a lot more information about the number of jobs that will be created and um, over over what period of time and what the impacts are going to be on communities because there are a lot of communities supporting these things too that that are desperately <coughs> needing the jobs in their own you know in their own backyard so it's not a I don't think it's an easy it's an uneasy issue for labor. I, I um, thought when Janet said sorry I just thought when Janet said you know we have to figure out what we're for. As that's so important, right. you know. We do, it's so important. We can't just be against right. stuff. People, most people wake up in the morning. They, most people don't wake up in the morning thinking, "What am I going to say no to today?" Right? Right. Or maybe you all do. <laughs> I, I don't think most people do. So I think we got to figure out things that people can say yes to. Because it feels better. But I do think it's significant. In the governor's senior energy plan, you know, exporting raw energy commodities from another state is not at the top of the list of a, an economically oriented 10-year energy action plan. Um, and so there's a whole lot more in there that would create a whole lot more jobs and, and benefit the climate. I mean, the energy efficiency jobs, even from Clean Energy Works alone, already sounds like perhaps more than, than what may be offered. Leslie, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, well, and I, I want to say I'm saying this, understanding this broader context of when People need jobs, they need jobs. You know, if any of us are faced with not being able to feed our kids or losing our home, et cetera, the choice we're going to make is to have a job and some income. And, and I know unions are faced every day with having to deal with that harsh reality. Um, but, but one thing I want to say in terms of the broader context and framing is that there is this, um, this current economic paradigm that says growth at all costs is good, <clears throat> and that equates uh, uh, looking at talking about consumption and reducing consumption as bad for people or contrary to people's economic interests. And, there, and, and I think people need to think about how do we take this on because, you know, there's a lot of evidence out there that when people consume less of things that are really kind of damaging to the environment too, they have more money to do things like retrofit their homes or buy healthy local food, or buy a really great tool from a local manufacturer that's going to last 100 years, you know, rather than something with built-in obsolescence that will last five minutes. You know, and that's a, that's a green product. So that's, that's one thing I wanted to say is it's just, you know, there is this issue of consumption that's kind of coming to the forefront, and we just, we can't ignore that no matter what kind of growth we're talking about, but if we focus on growth that really meets people's needs, both for income, you know, health care, um, public transit and things like that, I think we're focusing in the right place. And, and one other thing I wanted to say is that public, a lot of public sector jobs are green jobs. I work for DEQ, the State Environmental Agency. Last session we lost 100 out of 700 of our jobs, mm -hmm. our permanent positions, and most of those were union positions. And that's, that's nothing compared to what's happened to some states. So we, you know, we also have green jobs, and I think 
the, the focus ends up a lot, and I don't mean just from people in this room, but with this, um, this economic paradigm we're dealing with, you know, this idea that private industry has to drive all these things and make these improvements and help create jobs. Well, the public sector does that too. And we don't need to find ways to support those jobs. Thanks. So there's a bunch of hands that went up, and uh, we actually are, it's about time to break into groups. And so, um, we'll, ha uh, we'll have a, we have a, we have a, so let me tell you what's going to happen next. Uh, how, how much, Dave? Oh, thank you all very much. So our idea with these breakout groups is it'll give you more of a chance to get into these conversations with each other. Um, and uh, what, and we're hoping, we're going to take 45 minutes in them, and then everybody come back and tell us what you figured out as far as next steps. Yeah. And, we're gonna, and there are three of these breakout groups. Um, sure. I'm going to ask the people who are um, leading the breakout groups to say a couple words about what they're going to do in the group. So the first one is on um, energy, and that's uh, Ted. What are you going to so, do in your group? I don't want to steal from my colleagues who are doing the weatherization, conservation, and the transportation issues, but we have a special guest in our group, and that's Judy Barnes, <laughs> uh, Oregon's leading expert on feed-in tariffs, which is one of the fast turnaround tools available uh, to create good green union jobs. Um, and we're going to do a quick round for whoever's there about who we are, why we're here, um, and then we'll start talking about solutions. I got to bring up Okay, the last and then thing. Lori, you were um, yeah. going to do the, the one on energy efficiency. Yeah, energy efficiency and conservation will have Ben with us. And um, you know, we'll be mainly talking about buildings, public, private, um, residential, commercial, industrial, and how we can really cut down um, our energy usage. Okay, and then Dave, you were going to do the one on transportation. Yeah, transportation, and we have Opal. And uh, and don't forget the announcements. And the an, okay announcements. So, we're, so here's what's going to happen. We're going to put Ted's group back by the food. So if you go to Ted's group, you're going to get to keep eating. We're, we'll put Lori's group back in the corner with the comfortable oh, yeah. furniture. All right, nice. that's the energy group. And then Dave's group, where, where's you? You want to be up here in the front. Yeah, right up here in the front if you want to do that. And what we have one quick announcement. Where's. What? Oh, there, go. Okay, so really briefly, I'm Abigail. I work with PCAST for the Portland Central America Solidarity Committee. And I wanted to just invite everyone to come to a community forum on climate justice that we are organizing with several other groups in town, including Opal and Bose and Public Justice and Coon and a few others. Um, and that will be happening on July 11th. It's a Wednesday evening as well. Um, and I think a lot of what we're talking about tonight is, is definitely going to be part of the conversation. And we also want to bring in some other issues that are really critical to climate change and climate justice, including immigration and migration. Um, what is the global movement for climate justice and how can we kind of be in solidarity on the local level? Uh, Megan's over there handing out flyers, so grab a flyer before you head out um, with more details. Um, so we're also going to have some of there talking about the farm worker movement and some of the work that they're doing to bridge labor and farm worker rights and uh, climate and sustainability work. Um, but it will be a lot of discussion. We're going to have kind of some quick framing comments from folks and then small groups um, and really talk about how can we concretely support each other because I think you know we have we have a lot of kind of shared agreement around how can we do that so can we just use the conversation Report back, and I'm going to give you two minutes, and I'm going to I'm going to tap, I'm going to find you on my on my handy dandy little stopwatch here. Um, so what what we want to hear is not your whole discussion, because I walked around and they were very rich discussions, very good discussions going on in all three groups, but kind of what, what you came up with, next steps, ideas, things you want to continue talking about. So uh, whose group wants to go first? 
Do I have to get up? We have partners. Okay, we have partners. Okay. Well, he's going to be a time? really good discussion about transportation. Uh, and uh, okay, so I, I got two minutes. Well, what we talked about is we need a multi-mobile approach to transportation. There's no one solution to our transportation needs in Portland. What we need to have is we need to have a good mass transit system. Now, there's lots of different kinds of mass transit that we're looking at. Some of them are better than others. Some are more fitting for our needs than others. We can make those decisions, but we've got to make the commitment to, to make the investment. We need to have bicycles. We need to get people off their, in, out of their cars into the bikes. And we need a safe transportation for bicycles. We also need to have pedestrians use the streets. We need to have close pedestrian uh, paths so that we can have safe ways to, to work where we can actually walk or walk to our mass transit or walk to our cars, whatever. But we need to have a transportation system that's multimodal, that's ready to be a, a good transportation for all of our needs. But more funding, funding but the most important part is we need to fund our new green infrastructure needs with a green funding model. Right now the city of Portland is 100 percent dependent on the state shared revenue, which is gas tax. And so the more successful we are in Portland to get people out of their cars, the less money we have coming into Portland to actually fund our streets and thoroughfares. Wow. Right now we have a $900 million backlog in, in, in infrastructure needs in the city of Portland when it comes to transportation. Now that's serious because for every dollar you don't put into maintenance of your street, you pay $10 in reconstruction costs. And we're quickly getting to the point where it's going to be unaffordable. So we have to address this green, green uh, uh, funding model as soon as possible so we can actually afford the transportation we all need. There's a city in Brazil that has, by making a really efficient bus system, they've cut their, uh, they've cut it, Hmm? Mark, where is it? 50 times the number. Okay, they've cut it way below. <laughs> 1.3 million passengers, 50 times the number from 20 years ago. 80% of travelers use the express and direct bus service. Um, they're way ahead of all the other cities in Brazil, which are way ahead of us. So it's doable. <laughs> Um, next group, who wants to be next? Ted, you want to? Okay. So, so, so we created uh, three jobs in our committee. Um, just to kick off the needs of the community, we created one for uh, herding cats, um, <laughs> one for uh, bruise repair, and uh, there was clearly a need for a more competent facilitator. So, <laughs> but you have nice well, hands. <laughs> but we did we did try to talk about solutions. Um, we were um, trying to focus on that, although we did have a great example of where these things can come into conflict and into conversation around difficult questions focused around the coal issue because we have folks interested in and working on, in essence, both sides of that, the jobs that come out of coal export and stopping coal export because of the health or climate impacts. So we talked about the feed-in tariffs and, and program and, and policies in some detail. Uh, the need for core social and economic change. Um, I think the summary there might be that globalized corporate monopoly capitalism, this is not going to end well. Uh, community organizing, direct outreach, door-to-door, uh, -door, the importance of actually working with folks on a grassroots basis. Not forgetting about reality, that pie in the sky doesn't really matter if you're hungry. God won't save us. <laughs> She's trying. <laughs> Not hard enough. God helps those who help themselves. That there are multiple paths, um, and that there's some importance to the education of people about those and to the psychology. Uh, Jeremy alluded to some of that, um, and, and to the, the fear involved. Um, the line I've always liked, comparable to the Darwin one, is from Kurt Vonnegut, who said, human beings are the only species who won't save themselves because it's not cost-effective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the importance of modeling, of demonstrating, of showing that things can be done, and I think Siwa and Herka and some of the, the deep weatherization programs, Lori will get to that, I'm sure. Um, and transitioning, skill evolution, the importance of actually seeing that this is not an overnight 
we, we didn't get into this mess quickly. We're not going to get out of it overnight. In the meantime, people are hungry, and we have to deal with that. And then the people's budget is one federal model for, and we're going to have a, Barry, we're going to have a general conversation in just a moment uh, for dealing with all of this. So I think that's, that's a summary. Okay. Yeah, so uh, the efficiency group, um, we uh, recognize that the efficiency is the cheapest uh, way to uh, solve our energy problems with the low hanging fruit we are focusing on. We brought up a uh, suggested goal of thinking about, um, the strategy has around a 10% uh, retrofit our building stock annually. It's kind of an aggressive goal, but it needed to be something to be injecting and talking about in the conversations around the in your energy plan. So it's, um, ten year, I guess, a ten percent, I guess, citywide or statewide, depending on how you look at it. Um, we talked about the financial piece as being the big barrier. Uh, we've got to figure out ways to finance these uh, this retrofit work. Um, uh, new uh, competing interests, if there's incentives and subsidies, there's competing interests for those type of the dollars. So I uh, was talking about how the you know the tax structure needs to be addressed and thought about. Uh, in order to spend money on things like this when there's so many competing interests. Um, we talked about the workforce development piece and the need for uh, uh, unions to be involved uh, in the 10-year energy plan workforce development piece to make sure that if there's a success in filling these uh, jobs that there's going to be the workforce there uh, to staff them and take care of it. And uh, uh, the issue of dealing with renters, renters as owners is a big one. Uh, that Problem that was raised that needs to be thought about and addressed. Uh, the owner, uh, the owner of the building is being rented as a plus stake in the interest of its uh, energy savings. And then lastly, uh, folks uh, recognize the need that we've just got a ton of work to do on education uh, to get more people involved in that effort to build energy efficiency. Yeah. All right. I'd like to add to the last group, the, the one on the bottom, the people's budget. If there would be money taken from the wealthy, then people would have money to spend on restaurants, on other things, on money to support on support jobs. <laughs> right. Yeah, money is a, the money is So um, I, I am not quite sure where we want to go from here, except that I think there's probably some energy in the room to go somewhere. Um, there, are, there are a couple of concrete opportunities that I heard in some of the groups. One is there's an OPAL meeting coming up, is that right? Yes, July 17th. Okay. OPAL, so say what OPAL stands for. for it's Organizing party. People, Activating Leaders, Environmental Justice, Oregon. And we, our bus riders unite, we're trans, that's our big thing right now. Did you say July 17th? July 17th. At five, it's a, Tuesday, I believe. Tuesday or Wednesday. It will be at 5.30 at 24.07 uh, Southeast 49th. Straight off Division. You can take the 471 and I believe yeah. it's a 14. So this is a group that's organizing against the TriMet fare increases and all that. We just want to help them do it better. We want there you go. our good old, we want everybody back with in Portland to get it. Right. Um, another thing is that there is a, uh, oh, Fred, go ahead. The, the, governor's, the governor's energy plan that we've been talking about is open for comments until the end of July. We know they're going to probably have three or four public meetings. Um, one, possibly, I don't know exactly where, they haven't announced it this week or next. But in mid-July, there will be at least one and maybe two meetings in the Portland area. And while it's fine to send in comments, it's even better to go to those. And even if you only get to talk for three minutes, to underscore the important the parts you think are important or need to be improved. Because the more turnout we have for those meetings, the more momentum we have for actually getting some of those pieces adopted in the next legislature in the near future. And all the issues we've been talking about tonight are, are covered in part in that 10-year plan to a greater or lesser extent. 
Um, the, there, you have a handout in your packet. It's a one pager. It's got Dave King's name at the top. It's a list of web, web pages and publications. The, the what, website what can find. Where, where is it? We don't, we don't know. He just said we don't know yet. But to find, the, to find this in order to download it and read it, um, it's, on, it's on that list. And then if you want to, we can, we've got, at least for those of you who signed in, we've got your email addresses. We can send out an email and let you know. Do you want to? Well, you want more emails in your life? I don't have email. Oh, that's one I'm missing. Um, Barbara, <laughs> for those who don't have email, we'll give you a call. It's very easy to Google 10-Year Energy Plan Oregon, and you'll get right to the web page. 10-Year Energy Plan Oregon, and, and, and you'll see. Um, may I mention something else in that relation? Um, something that came up in our group is that this whole transition to a clean energy economy and off of fossil fuels in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and address climate change has two big pieces, as I see it. They're reducing the energy usage, which is the energy efficiency and, and, and weatherization, reduction in our usage. And then the, the, the next part is, because we're never going to get down to zero usage, how do we make sure that the energy we do use comes from those clean energy resources? So how do we replace the fossil fuel energy we currently use and replace that with clean energy? That's the energy generation piece. And our organization, Oregonians for Renewable Energy Policy, which advocates for this feed-in tariff program, addresses that part of the puzzle. And we are now forming a coalition of organizations and individuals to campaign for the kinds of things that this policy will bring to us and in the energy plan. Um, and we, are, we have meetings, we have conference calls, and we are going to be rolling out a campaign over the next several months to convince legislators that in energy generation, we want distributed generation, we want the benefits going to Oregonians, they should benefit and multiply in our own state economy, and low income as well as high income people should all benefit. We want those issues of equality and equity to be in our energy generation piece as well as the energy efficiency piece. So if you're interested in being part of that, I would suggest just visit our, um, well, they've got... Do, do you have a sign-in sheet on your table? I do, okay, I do. So if yes, you want to get on yes, Judy's list, yes. sign, we should sign in over there. And you have our email in some of the packets, so some of the materials. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Three things. One thing, that is probably the most immediate uh, thing going on, is the feed-in tariff program. Another thing is, uh, Democracy Now! this morning had a really good report on... on uh, the real mess, and uh, and the, but the the mayors around the world are pretty cool. It's a really interesting thing. Even Bloomberg, Bloomberg made a statement that day. And then the other thing is cool mayors. Was <laughs> 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 what I didn't miss? Oh, don't care. <laughs> 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 Is there a is there a favorite website for the real plus twenty thing? Just type in real plus twenty to find your website. That's and, and if you're interested in this from the union perspective, the International Trade Union Confederation, ITUC, has a website and they've been they've had a delegation of union members from all over the world attending and I just read their latest one today. They're very unhappy with how things are going. So they've got a website as well. And I think it's also on that web page list that you have. It was PCAST PCAST the date for PCAST. Oh, um, yeah, there's a couple of things to mention. One is the Climate Justice Forum that we announced earlier, and there's quite on the table. Um, we also have a member who is in Rio right now, Carrie Co, and she will be doing, she'll be doing a brief report back at the Climate Justice Forum, but then a more in-depth report, um, probably some later date, so. And what was the date on this one again? July 11th. July 11th. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, any other kind of immediate next steps, things yeah. coming up? Great. Uh, we have a meeting, we uh, announced it in a small group, but a meeting of the Community Assembly for People's Budget, which is uh, looking at sources of uh, revenue and how and money is distributed now on local levels and how it can be distributed in a different way. Uh, we're having a meeting on Tuesday the 26th at 7 p.m. at the First Unitarian Church. 
Would, we, would it be through Jobs of Justice? Would you have a link up? Not really. Maybe. It's up on JoeAnybody.com. So give me a few days, and this will be available by just putting in Joe Anybody Climate. This meaning the video? This video. Oh. Yeah, it'll be up on YouTube in a couple days. Just put in Joe Anybody Climate Jobs, and you'll probably find it through For a search. For your friends that couldn't come. Can... For your, yeah, there you go. Um, so we have another video. He's working with me, so oh, yeah, awesome. two are together. <laughs> that's Joe somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's Joe somebody. <laughs> Mobile T and Johnny Bates. So I guess, I guess we're going to wrap up. Um, okay. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for staying till the, till the end. Wow, I'm really amazed yeah. that there's so many people still here. And, um, and all I can really say is just keep talking to each other. Let's have these conversations together and have the hard conversations with each other that that some of us try to avoid because they're so painful. Remember the people's budget. And remember the people's budget. <laughs> 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 